<clears throat> All right, it looks like the number is stabilizing. So let's start. Uh, welcome everyone to this panel discussion titled Beyond Expectations, Pasts, Presents and Futures in Native Art. This event is organized as part of the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group, a group within the University of Cambridge that is supported by the Cambridge Heritage Research Center. We're honored to host such an experienced, accomplished and distinguished panel and chair, and we would like to thank um, all of them for taking part in this today and sharing with us. Um, I will start by introducing Devlin Gandhi, our chair, before handing it over to him. Devlin is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and was born and raised in the Santa Monica Mountains just north of Los Angeles, California. He's currently a PhD candidate in archaeology, archaeogenetics at the University of Cambridge. He has received an MPhil in archaeology from the University of Cambridge and graduated from the University of California, Berkeley with a BA in anthropology. His research and academic work explores the potential for archaeology as a decolonizing practice capable of empowering indigenous self-determination and sovereignty. Thank you once again to all the panelists and everyone watching for tuning in. And I hand it over to Devlin. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, it's great to be here today. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm really impressed by the turnout. Um, as Oliver said, my name is Devlin Gandhi. I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and a PhD candidate in archeology span at the University of Cambridge. And I wanna begin this by thanking everybody for joining us today on Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, today's panel focuses on art created by artists who are part of North American Indigenous communities, sometimes referred to in the broad sense as Native American, Aboriginal, Indigenous, and First Nations. For this panel, I chose to use the term Native as our ancestors were, were part of this land long before Europeans called the land America. Uh, the panel's title, Beyond Expectations, Past, Presence, and Futures in Native Art, is meant to begin with a moment of reflection on what Native art is expected to be, on what Native people are expected to act and look like. Answers to these questions are interwoven with the legacies of colonization, manifest destiny, and centuries of genocidal tactics undertaken by the settler colonial states and governments, aimed at erasing Native identities, autonomy, and sovereignty. But we remain. We are strong. We have endured. And more than that, we are thriving. And I think today is a wonderful day to honor that and discuss that topic. As the title implies, this panel is divided into three sections, pasts, presents, and futures. Uh, these will be discussed over the course of the next hour, and we will do our best to field any questions that the audience might have at the end of the hour. Now, without any further delay, it is my honor to introduce our four panelists. I'm gonna start with Jada. Jada, could you wave or say hi quick? Awesome. Uh, Jada Gray Eagle is an Aglala Lakota artist born in the Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. When I say artist, Jada does many wonderful creative things. Jada is a photographer, a producer, a beadwork artist, a writer, a journalist, and a curator. Jada holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and an emphasis in photography from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Her photography has been published in numerous publications such as Native People's Magazine, Indian Country Today, Briar Patch, Vogue, and most recently, I actually just saw her work in uh, US News and World Report. Jada is the co-producer of the award-winning Sisters Rising documentary, and Jada has also received numerous fellowships, her most recent, a curatorial fellowship on art of the Americas and Africas at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Thank you, Jada, for joining us. Uh, next is Jordan and Craig. Jordan, could you say hi? Awesome. Uh -huh. Uh, Jordan, uh, Jordan Ann Craig is a Northern Cheyenne artist born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. She received her BA from Dartmouth College in 2015 and has since traveled nationally and internationally pursuing her art. Her work includes paintings, prints, collages, textile prints, and artist books. A recipient of numerous awards, grants, and fellowships, in 2019, Jordan was an artist in residence at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. In addition, and for the past year, Jordan has been part of the Roswell, Instit Roswell Artist in Residence program. In addition, Jordan, along with her sister Madison, are the co-founders of Shy Natives, a lingerie line aimed at reclaiming indigenous bodies and sensuality while providing a safe and supportive platform for humans to express, them express themselves for however they like. Uh, next, we have Rico, Rico World. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> 
Rico is a Tlingit Athabascan designer, jeweler, and artist born and raised in Alaska. Rico is a co-founder of Trickster Company, which he co-owns with his sister, Crystal Worrell. Trickster Company promotes innovative design focused on the Northwest Coast art, Northwest Coast art and exploration of themes and issues in Native culture. More broadly, Rico's work speaks to the experience of living with traditional values as a modern person. In addition to his artistic pursuits, Rico holds a BA in anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania. And our last panelist, I will show you Alvitre, is a Tongva artist and illustrator and comic book artist. Well established within indigenous art community, he was born in Santa Monica Mountains at Satwiwa. She grew up close to the land and was raised with traditional knowledge that inspires the work she does today. Washoyo has a BA in Fine Arts from the California State University Channel Islands, but has been illustrating since she got out of high school. Washoyo's illustration career is prodigious. She has contributed to numerous award-winning books, including Tales of the Mighty Code Talkers, Volume 1, Ghost River, and At the Mountain's Base. Most recently, Washoyo has become a Marvel Comics illustrator for the native comic book superhero Echo. Washoyo has also created numerous notable political illustrations in support of indigenous rights, including such issues as No Dapple Movement for Standing Rock, Protect Mauna Kea in Hawaii, No Border Walls on Tribal Lands, and the Not Your Mascot Movement, to name a few. So with that said, thank you so much for joining us today. I am so thankful that you guys were able to take the time and be part of this. Um, I'd like to begin this panel by focusing first on the past and discussing some of the pasts that have shaped you and your experience to get to where you are today. And I'd actually like to start this by asking Washoyo, uh, could you tell me about when you first knew you wanted to pursue art? Um, what was it inspired you to make art and how has your culture and identity influenced your art? Um, I think I knew from a very young age, my parents both um, encouraged me greatly as much as they could financially to um, always keep me in art supplies and, you know, really, really encourage um, just any form of art. My mom, she was an illustrator um, and she's also a seamstress. Um, and my dad is, um, he, he was a fine artist. He used to paint, he used to do um, pen and ink illustration, um, more as a hobby, not as a profession. Um, and he's also a self-taught um, silversmith and goldsmith. So growing up, I had two parents that were both um, very creative people and um, they just really encouraged it all the way up to now. They're very encouraging of the work that I do. Um, when I was about five, I, I saw the Disney movie, The Little Mermaid, and the ability to see such beautiful line work in motion um, really inspired me. And I, at that point, I think I wanted to become an animator. So I pursued animation for a good part of um, my childhood up until I was a teenager and attended um, the CalArts Summer School for Animation. Um, and when we finished that up, basically the teachers were saying, you know, you're, you're all very good at what you do and we really encourage you to pursue this outside of, um, you know, your lives professionally. But the, the reality is that Disney is closing their hand-drawn animation studios. Most of the animation work is going overseas and you probably won't have a job. So it, it was a constant reminder growing up that, yeah, you can do art. People will encourage you to do art, but it may not be the most lucrative profession. Um, and at that point, I was just so interested in the storytelling that I was trying to pursue it in any, any way that would allow me to share storytelling. Um, I didn't actually do any native-based work up until um, after I had graduated from college because I, I felt very protective of it. And also growing up with a first name like my name, um, you, you automatically get pegged as the native person or where does your name come from and tell me the story about your name. So um, I experienced kind of that and grew kind of a tough shell growing up, not wanting to share um, traditional stories or any native based work um, until I sort of felt like I had a safe environment to do so. And then I started doing, um, you know, political art when I felt, you know, empowered to do it in the, the things that I was seeing going around um, and happening across the United States. And growing up with a very politically active father, um, it just kind of fell into the work that I do and continue to do. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Jada, love to hear your story. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, um, I think that, I don't know, I feel like I was just born into being an artist. I remember being a really young kid and cutting up really intricate pieces of paper and making patterns on the floor. And my teachers were like, I think 
this girl's an artist. Like, and so they were really super supportive of me and they used to give me an option to either stay inside and make art or go outside and play recess. And it was like, you know, whatever I wanted to do. And my parents were also very supportive. Um, they used to buy me the little cameras. Um, oh geez, I made my video all big. <laughs> um, yeah, they used to buy me little, you know, disposable cameras and I used to shoot uh, like film all, all the time. I used to fill up my parents' film cameras. And then I think it was whenever I was 17, they finally bought me my own digital camera. And from there, I just continued to, to photograph and, and to get into photojournalism and into photography. And that ultimately is what I ended up chasing was photography, so. Awesome, thank you. Jordan, would you like to share? Okay, hi. I had a similar story as Jada, um, always very creative growing up. Um, I actually recently asked my mom, when did I start becoming an artist? And she said uh, roughly like four years old. Um, so I was always drawing and painting with my sisters and my parents were really supportive in providing us supplies, just like our other panelists. And I continued to pursue it through middle school, high school, college, and then post-college. So my parents were very crafty growing up. I don't really have any immediate artist family members, but my mom was super crafty and creative, also a seamstress, sewed most of my clothes when I was little. And then my dad was an, is an engineer, but he could draw and paint hyper-realistically and um, build furniture. So I had a lot of different inspiration within my own nuclear family to become an artist. Thank awesome, you. thank you. And uh, Rico, love to hear what you have to say. Um, I guess, I think creativity is like, is like, is sort of ingrained with, with native culture, with any native culture. And so it's just always there for all of us. Uh, but that being said, I, I actually didn't ever consider myself an artist until about maybe four years ago. Um, I, but there was always like creative projects around and I did have um, you know, the same thing where the, that everyone else mentioned and there's, there was always somebody in my family who was making sure that there were supplies for creative projects. And um, it, yeah, it, it, I, I just, there was always something kind of being made by somebody and, and I would always participate in some sort of way. Um, and I actually, so I got my degree in anthropology and then came home and was working in uh, NAGPRA repatriation kind of work. And that just kind of like even further put me into the world of art, like being surrounded by all these old master works and um, being able to like see them up close, visit museums. Um, it, it just became at a certain point, I don't know what happened. It just, it just engulfed me and um, somehow I ended up being an artist. It's amazing. Um, I guess one question that I'm, well, one thing that I've noticed with all of you is that you all share a really strong family support system that's kind of allowed you to excel in art. Um, but the second thing, which we'll show you, and also Rico mentioned, is the connection to Native identity, Native heritage and tradition, and also the question of whether or not or how to make art related to that. Um, I'm curious to hear more maybe from Jada or Jordan on that topic too. Do you want to go, Jordan, or do you want me to go? You're muted. <laughs> oh, you go first. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm also a beadwork artist, and personally, I feel like my connection to beadwork is probably a little different than most people's. Like, you know, I'm, I don't come from a powwow family. Um, I don't, I've never actually really even got to witness a powwow because I'm always, I was always working in the booths, right? Like I was the one making fry bread while everybody got to dance. <laughs> my, my beadwork comes from, you know, like my, 
my mother used to make daisy chains to sell to tourists on our reservation growing up. And that's where my beadwork comes from. My, my grandmother used to make like wrapped lanyards to sell. And so my beadwork isn't necessarily from the traditional route that I think beadwork necessarily comes from. Like I, I wasn't making regalia, um, but I, I make earrings. You know, I make things for adornment rather than things for, for regalia. Um, and so like my ties are, are definitely a little different than, than most people's. And then also, you know, in terms of like my photography and documentary work, I feel like my, my work is to repair some of the past harms that have been done in terms of photography and in terms of documentary work. So I want to be able to show Native people that, you know, we are a resilient people. We did survive a genocide and we aren't like what mainstream media shows us as being. So there's my. Powerful, thank you. Jordan, do you got anything to add or should we move on? Yeah, well, most recently I've been studying in different collections. Um, I've been studying Cheyenne beadwork to create my paintings. And that's how I've been finding my inspiration, um, I would say since 2018-19. And when I was a fellow at IIA, um, when I got to also be a fellow alongside Rico Worrell, and this is where I also got to meet Jada, um, this is where I first started um, really examining and recontextualizing indigenous beadwork, specifically Cheyenne beadwork. And before that, um, I was mostly doing really abstract work. And I also was kind of um, maybe also protecting that side of myself and also not really sure of that side, my indigenous side. And um, I've been more confident to express that, that art now. Uh, my mom was adopted in the 1960s in um, rural Montana, so she also did not grow up um, and had a very unique background being an adopted woman. And so um, when I'm studying these things and my mom is studying these things, it's like our way of returning and, and studying our culture, um, even kind of from an outside perspective. And for shy natives, um, it's really not based too much in tradition as much as it is in empowerment and um, changing how indigenous bodies are viewed. So we really, we love to work with indigenous um, photographers, musicians, artists, models, and we're making work to make people feel beautiful and confident. And um, most recently I've designed a pattern that has been printed on the lingerie. And so that'll be one way to bring um, our, our design work, our indigenous design work into the actual um, pieces. So that's a really exciting shift. So it's kind of all new and developing as I go, honestly. All really exciting and thank you for sharing. Um, with that said, I also want to comment on just this connection to the past. Um, Rico, you mentioned working in museum collections, so did Jordan. Um, there's, we live in an interesting time where we have um, Native artists producing on a scale that really has never existed before. And there's more demand for Native art than at any other point in history, to my knowledge. Where, um, Native artists are also getting, um, getting sold out shows and selling art at unprecedented prices. At the same time, we still have so much of Native identity curated in museum collections and held in museum collections. And even the concept of Native art. What is Native art? is something that has often been decided on by colonizers, by settler states. It's something that we as Native people have never really had much of a say in in the art world. And so I'm kind of, I'm curious what you all think is Native art. What should we define Native art and what would, should we not define as Native art? Where is the line that you draw between what you create or what might be in museum collections? I don't know if anybody wants to step up to start with that conversation. Um, I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's, that's a really difficult question, I think. Um, me, my, speaking personally, I am Tongva and I'm Scottish um, and a few other things as well. And um, just 
that alone and finding representation for native Californians in the museum world is a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, oftentimes when I see native representation in gallery settings or in the fine art world, it's oftentimes, um, it has sort of a, a center sometimes around either powwow culture or what native people are expected to look like or um, the artwork that they're kind of expected to do. So I feel sometimes, um, you know, to the detriment that curators are are still lingering on kind of stereotypes and pulling things that people identify automatically as native in order to put it into a museum setting. Um, I'm seeing some work come out that's really, really turning that on its head. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to see, you know, really high profile artists working in the gallery setting um, to kind of stop that and to, um, you know, put out work that's as, on par with some of the top artists internationally in the world, um, but without being so bold and putting it out in just a native flavor, I guess. Um, so I kind of stay away from the gallery world personally. Um, I don't feel like the representation is that, uh, it hasn't developed to a point where I, I feel comfortable entering in that world. Um, and I think there's a lot of politics still going on between curators, between art sellers, um, and the whole political and financial side of the art world, which is very um, white centric and, you know, um, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing for me personally. Um, it's it's a, a world outside of where I, I have a comfort level. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, we've spoken. I before. could add to. Oh, go ahead. That. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so I also totally agree. It has been really difficult to navigate the gallery scene as a fine artist myself. Um, and that being said, it's like evolving and changing so rapidly. And I can't even say like, I, I mean, I think it's amazing that my abstract work is starting to be recognized. My peers abstracts works. Um, people are not necessarily just making these landscape paintings. There's people making erotic art. There's people making sound art. There's um, people making documentaries and it's just so broad. So when people talk about like native art, it really just, it doesn't encompass the, range of all these identities coming together and um, I'm really proudly in a show curated by a native artist um, named Natani Nota and it is at the Berkeley Art Center and it's there's actually a live uh, viewing of the show today on Indigenous Peoples Day and it's with four Indigenous women artists but I just love how um, Natani is talking about the show because it's more politically driven and um, it's more about the art and the artist than um, really proclaiming this indigenous identity. Like the art is clearly by indigenous women, but she's made it to be so much more than that. And um, it's just, it's an amazing show and I'm really proud to be in that. And I do think the show is important because it has a native curator, because it um, includes these really strong artists and I'm really honored to be a part of that group. Um, so I, I do think that there's huge changes happening and there's a lot of like incredible native artists that I look up to and that are paving these paths for change and to make native art on like the wider contemporary level beyond like all these white expectations. So, and the, the title of the show is called We Have Teeth Too. <laughs> which is really amazing. You should post if you have a link to it, maybe in the chat so people could check it out a little bit later today. Yeah, totally. Um, for sure. Good idea. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to comment too. I think you make such a great point. Um, and I, I think it is much more eloquent than what, what I was trying to say. But yeah, just appreciating the art that artists do, not because they're native, that it can have a native feel to it and I think maybe that's where I, I am hesitant in entering that world but seeing you know I see people doing it and I see it being um, you know treated more respectfully I think in a contemporary context which is so important so I'm, I would like to tune into your zoom later <laughs> it sounds exciting 
Awesome. Thank you both for those incredible responses. Um, one thing that um, just to ask a little bit more about this topic, because as somebody who is at Cambridge and does really see a lot of how native people are illustrated in the UK and in Europe, um, a lot of the times modern artists are shown alongside with um, ancestral objects and even ancestors. And I'm kind of curious your take on that role in museums and this idea that everything that native people have done in the past is art and who owns that. Um, maybe Rico, would you be interested in talking about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I think, I think that we, as, as we mentioned earlier, is like we all have, we all have ties to our, our cultures in certain ways. And, um, okay, hopefully I don't get too lost, but to kind of go back a little bit, I think to answer that, that last question also is I think, um, there was, a, a person that was at, in, at UPenn that went there with me and when asked that question, she said, uh, she was a Mi'kmaq artist. If she makes a basket in the traditional style, nobody questions it. But if she makes just uh, a photo, takes a photo of something in Philly, is it native art? And she was like, I think it is. Like anything that, if a native artist makes it, it's native art. Like, and so it's, and it's, and it's kind of inherently tied in to, to our roots. So to go, and it's informed by our roots. And so like, there's absolutely that. Um, so at a, at a certain level, it's fair to show, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, a modern native with some, you know, traditional old, things because those are our roots and we do have a relationship to them. Um, but I think I, I, I have to agree with what everyone else has said is like, is if, if, if that's the defining factor, it's, it's not enough because, um, because we're, we're all so much more dynamic than that as cultures and as modern cultures. Oh yeah, I'm mute still. Thank you guys. It's funny, um, apologies for that. I said, thank you, Rico, for you made some really good and salient points there, uh, especially in terms of the diversity and the agency of native people. I mean, this idea that we just simply have to make a traditional craft as being the authentic native versus just taking a photo in Philly is a prime example for this. Um, Jada, I'm curious from your perspective a bit as a curator, uh, if you could just fill in a little, maybe just discuss your own experiences with this topic at all, especially in museum spaces. Like in terms of showcasing historical items next to contemporary? Well, not like simply showcasing, but also the question of, do you consider his, all historical items art? Or is there a line that we also need to draw between things that aren't art? Sure, that's a big question. It I is mean, a big question, like, and there's no right answer there. <laughs> Honestly, I could just say that I think that um, the people who we come from, not to like put us all in the same box, but lived so beautifully that like I personally look at it as art. Um, and I think the question that I feel probably more comfortable answering is maybe like, that would probably encompass more of like what I'm trying to get to is why I personally support Native art. So I've recently become, you know, I, I got a full-time job. Like I'm, I'm wearing my big girl pants now. I just recently graduated. And so I have been able to support a lot of Native artists. And I was thinking about it, like why I purchased Native art and everything. Like I just, speaking about basket weaving, I just purchased this really beautiful pair of like these weaved, earrings from this young artist in the Northwest Coast and she and I was thinking about like how long that art must have been passed down to her like her family's you know basket weavers and, and just how long of a lineage that is that's like helping her to remember who she was and who she comes from and now she's turning them into earrings and so I like this thought of helping 
you know, Native people with their art, remember who they are and remember who they come from. And so I feel like personally, whenever I'm purchasing, you know, a pair of earrings or purchasing a painting, I'm helping somebody to, I'm, I'm paying them to remember their lineage. You know, I'm paying them to help them remember who they are. So I feel like that answers more of what I'm trying to get to than, than trying to encompass like an answer to that huge question of what is Native art, so. Of course, thank you so much. That was a really beautiful response. And I really liked how you phrased that, paying people to remember their culture and live their culture. I mean, it's a really beautiful way of looking at things. I guess this takes us also, we're move, we've moved from the past and conversations of our own past into this present, where we are drawing from the past to create a present, but also moving away from that. Jordan has touched on this with shy natives, uh, Jada now discussing on purchasing, uh, purchasing goods. Also question, Jada, where did you get your earrings from? They are Diani Whitehawk Polk. Um, she, uh, she's an incredible artist. So she does a lot of painting, beadwork, but she also makes really cool earrings too. That was really beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, so moving on, I guess one of the broader questions we can bring it down a bit is how do you see Native art preserving and continuing tradition in a changing world in your own experiences? I mean, uh, Rico, I'd like to ask you this question to start off with, um, because you recently just had installations put in in Juno uh, based off of native formline art that you created. So I'd like to hear a bit about that, maybe your thoughts on that experience, that process. Uh, I'm sorry, can you, can, you ask, can you say the question again? Yeah, of course. Um, how do you see art preserving and continuing tradition in a changing world? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm ready to answer. No, no worries. No worries. Well, let's put it a different way. How do you see your art anchoring, anchoring the community of Juno? I mean, you now have placed your artwork into these public spaces. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? When I when I moved back here to Juno after after I finished school, um, there was only certain types of of public art around downtown and. They were either, you know, very old traditional pieces, totem poles, or they were, um, we've got some kind of weird art here in Juno, to be honest. We, like there's like uh, this, this statue of this random dog that was hanging out on the docks a long time ago, this, this miner in a cave where it's just kind of like his butt like towards the audience. And um, it's really kind of eerie painting of all these, um, all these white people on a ship, supposedly, I guess they're, you know, coming to live in Southeast Alaska. Um, and so there wasn't much native art and especially not modern native art. And so, um, a lot of what I've tried to do with my work in, in Juno and, um, is to try and get that, that just that basic imprint that that um, Western society has allowed themselves all over downtown Juneau uh, in a much more broader sense in downtown Juneau. Downtown Juneau, Juneau is like a, a, a tourist community too. So we get about, a, about well, we did before, um, about a million tourists per year. So I think it, for me, was really important to be able to represent our mark in in the context of 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 Juno. Awesome. And then you have your little bit of hair that you've dyed as well with it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, Shoyo, uh, could you would you be willing to talk a bit about your experience in creating um, Echo and your illustrations for Marvel? Yeah. Um... <laughs> The, the Marvel Indigenous Voices is something that is like a, a very modern thing. Um, and I think it was put together with by uh, Jeffrey Varegi, who's a formline artist. Um, and he's really been pushing for Native um, and Indigenous representation, along with um, several of us who have worked over the years just in telling Native comic book stories. 
Um, so I was contacted by Marvel earlier in the year asking if I would participate in this anthology that they were putting out. Um, and of course I was, you know, very, very excited about it. And I immediately emailed them back and I said, hey, like, I, I don't know what characters are available, but I would love to um, try my hand at Echo. And Echo is a character that was created by David Mack, um, I believe in 2008 was when the first um, book came out. And at the time I was, I believe, man, I was in college, I think. <laughs> um, and I was familiar with David Mack's work through Kabuki. He does very beautiful watercolors and very avant-garde comic book art. And he's, um, you know, a, a superb storyteller. So when I saw that he was creating this character um, and that she was Native American, it really, really, you know, inspired me. So, you know, rolling back to present day, um, the, the editor, when I contacted her, she said, yeah, like Echo is actually available. So let me ask a couple of people, you know, make sure this is okay. And um, if so, then you can, probably, you know, take up that character if that's what you'd like to do. So I was super, super excited because, you know, being such a fan of the original work, um, it was a little bit of a dream for me to do. And I've been working on it for the past like month or so. I'm finishing up um, inks on that. But um, it, it goes to show the progress I think that we've made as indigenous people in contemporary work. Um, Marvel Comics, they had indigenous characters in the past and a lot of them are very problematic either in the way that they're shown um, in their, their dress is stereotypical or their stories involve shamanism or, you know, magical powers or the ability to talk to animals. Um, and the one thing I really loved about Echo was that she was just a superior um, learner. She's actually handicapped, she's deaf, um, but she almost overcompensates in other aspects of her life so she can pick up music by just, um, you know, feeling the vibrations on a piano. She can watch a Bruce Lee movie and pick up the, you know, the the moves and it I think it um, harkens to an understanding and a sense of the things that we're po we have potential to do and pick up um, that aren't involving magical powers um, and sometimes you know dealing with something like a handicap whether it's a physical handicap or you know not being able to hear in her case um, that you can strengthen all these other characteristics around yourself so um, I'm I'm really excited to see Marvel putting out representation by Native people and also written by Native people. Um, the story is written by Rebecca Roanhorse, who's a, a prolific writer, and um, she's won several awards. And, um, you know, like just having that representation in the pop culture industry, as well as by a major corporation such as Marvel, uh, I, I'm really hoping that just opens more doors for more people in the indigenous community to write and to draw Marvel stories, but also to be on the editorial team and to get into um, more niche areas in the company um, to help them with accurate representation. That's really, really inspiring and really powerful. I mean, as someone who used to be a bit of a comic book nerd myself, it was really refreshing to see that you got that, uh, that ability to illustrate Echo. And it's wonderful to hear your take. Um, I think your story also highlights a larger conversation about just representation in media in general, and representation not only in terms of having comic book heroes, but also just in pop culture in general that we can identify with and relate to. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, Jordan. Can you, uh, are you there? Yeah. Hey. Um, can I ask your perspective in a sense on how your clothing company, how Shy Natives is also focusing on dealing with longstanding issues of media representation of Native people, and Native bodies? Um, well, I think we could all agree that historically Native women, contemporarily Native women have been over-sexualized. Um, I mean, the violence happening against Native women today is just horrific. And the representation of Native women is just, it's like, it's really bad overall. I mean, Halloween costumes, even when people meet me, um, wherever I am, whether I'm in America, Europe, um, and they find out I'm Native, it's like, I'm mystical, I'm exotic, I'm this, I'm that. And um, there's just this like 
air of over sexualization happening. And so when me and my sister created Shy Natives, Shy Natives in 2017, it was more so to empower our own selves and to, um, I mean, I love film photography and Polaroids and vintage aesthetics and my sister was started sewing. So we put our two powers together and created our Instagram page, mainly just to inspire ourselves and put out really creative images. And as soon as the platform started to grow and our indigenous community expanded, um, people started to recognize the importance of what we were doing. Um, being one of the first indigenous owned lingerie brands, um, I mean, it, it says something, it says something to the progress we've made to being able to put our bodies out there and represent ourselves how we want to be represented and working with their different indigenous people, um, whether that is the model or a videographer. I've worked with Jada Grable, which has been such an honor through all our photo shoots um, in the past few years. So um, it's just, it's very multifaceted. So what we're doing is trying to just, well, reclaim our bodies, but also just have women be shown the way they want to be shown, whether they want to be really sexy or they want to be more covered. We're really respectful of what um, our, our people want. And that's been um, something we're navigating and learning about and learning people's stories and learning um, just how to represent people the way they want to be. So, um, I mean, if people want to be sexy, we want to help them show that off. Or if they want to be more covered and shy, we're, we're really um, respectful of how that needs to be shown. And so, I mean, through all the various shoots we've had, it's just been so healing and empowering. And we've gotten such good feedback just from those experiences and those times of being with the people on set, or even just learning and meeting people through different um, markets and fairs and um, like Christmas markets and whatnot. And it's been really beautiful. So we're trying to just like let ourselves tell the narrative as opposed to other people tell us what we are. Wonderful. I'd love to hear more from Jada about the type of collaboration you guys are doing, and especially kind of her take as a photographer going into this experience. Oh, yay. Um, yeah, no. So I actually got to meet Jordan and Maddie at um, First People's Fund. We're both First People's Fund fellows um, in Phoenix, Arizona, right? That's where we were, I think. <laughs> yeah. And um, I had heard of Shy Natives prior, but I didn't know who was behind it. And then I got to meet the two sisters behind it. And then um, Jordan was coming to Santa Fe uh, for her artist in residency and so we did I think three shoots while she was there and just being able to witness you know young indigenous people like just thrive in in these like pieces right like they were just so happy and so proud and it was just it was honestly it was really beautiful and especially for something like I tend to do more photojournalism or more photo essays or more photo documentary but something like this that was more commercial was actually it was a really beautiful experience for myself and I think everybody on set and I think one of the days we were there for like seven hours, but nobody was tired, right? Like everybody was just like, we were in it. We, we just kept going. And it was just this really beautiful collaboration and process where we were all just like, we knew what was going to happen was ultimately going to be very beautiful because it was uplifting um, these young indigenous folks, so. And to add on that, thank you, Jada. Um, you're talking about that shoot with Marissa and Jade, and these are two two spirit um, models, artists, and they were students at IAIA. And we had a um, a native stylist, we had a native uh, makeup artist, and then me and Jada being behind the camera together. And so it was a completely native. And then we also had Rico's jewelry on set as well. And, and a few other native jewelers. And we had a native potter. I mean, it was just, 
an incredible collaboration of so many indigenous voices and presence. And it was really healing and beautiful and, and just, it went on and on and on. I, I remember it like it was yesterday and it was really fun. So, and that's just one example of our shoots because we've done video shoots now and we've, I mean, every, I mean, my last shoot was in Los Angeles and um, we were dancing like the whole time, like the models, the photographer, the, I mean, it was just really fun, even though like times have been so dark. And so um, in, in light of everything happening, it was really powerful to come together and um, celebrate in the beautiful pieces that my sister sewed by hand. So it was really amazing. Um, but working with Jada and also Rico was just an honor and privilege, mm -hmm. especially on that campus. It's a beautiful campus and a beautiful place to create. Mm -hmm. AIA is beautiful. And also, I mean, just that entire experience sounds so cathartic. I'm curious, Jada, also to follow up more. Um, you mentioned in the introductions a bit just about um, how photographers have depicted Native people in general and also how you're kind of working to change that perspective that's been given to the public and to reclaim Native, Native perspectives. Um, could, I, could you share a bit more about that topic? I'm also curious if maybe this might tie in a bit to what Wishoyo is doing in terms of illustrating a female Native person in Marvel. Yeah, yeah. So I am a Lala Lakota and I do come from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And I lived there until I was about five. Um, but I have spent a lot of my summers there growing up. Um, my father was an attorney and my mother was a producer. And so I had witnessed a lot of media coming in into my community and they would always go and they would focus on people that were going through like the hardest times and they would always make these people like be the overall of what we represented to mainstream media so they would find you know what what we say there's a word um but it, it translates to like our most pitiful people right the people that are going through the roughest times of their lives and they would photograph them and they would say this is who the oglala people are and that you know that is some of us absolutely but that's not a full representation of who we are as a people you know they they never like showed my father who was an attorney they never showed you know my grandmother who was like this prolific writer they never showed like people who had done well for themselves despite everything that had happened to us and it's, I think it's because, you know, whenever you're an outsider and you're coming in, I think that just human beings have a negativity bias. And, and we're coming from this, this culture that um, platforms the white supremacist view of other people. And we're always othered. We're always put in this box. We're always represented as being pitiful and poor. And, but that's, that's not who we are at all. And so I feel like, in my life, you know, whenever I started pursuing photography, people told me I couldn't. They were like, you can't make it as a photographer. There's no space for you. It, there's, it's only old white guys that are photographers, right? Like, you're, you're a young Oglala woman, you know, you're not going to have that, that opportunity to be a photographer, but here I am. <laughs> it's what I do for my full-time job. I'm a photojournalist. Um, I'm also a curator of photography. So <laughs> those people don't know what they're talking about, first of all, but also I am able to see past that because I'm not platforming white supremacy. I'm not platforming this media view of, of othering people. I can see past that. So I feel like I have a strength in, in that. And I and here I am, I'm making it as a photographer. So Yes, you are. And that was so powerful. And thank you so much for that. And with all that said, you're also one of my favorite photographers. So thank you again for taking the time today to be part of this panel. <laughs> um, Shoyo, have you run into any, um, I'm curious, just your experience of me as someone who grew up with comic books, there was always this over-sexualization of women in general in comic books, but especially uh, women of color. So I'm curious your perspective going into this and kind of what your experiences have been to reclaim Echo. Yeah, um, wow. 
when I first started out, um, I would go, the only one time during the year that you'd actually meet an editor face to face was when you went to San Diego Comic Con for a portfolio review. So most of the time I was submitting my portfolio portfolios either via email or through snail mail um, with my name and so all of my competition and even now a lot of the competition are men um, the artists are men and the writers are men and there is a still a huge percentage of the comic book field is um, you know run by men and oftentimes uh, white men so the art styles that I was doing, you know, when I first tried getting into comics, I was adopting all of these things because growing up, all the things I was reading were drawn by men that sexualized women. Um, I've, I've also always kind of been a fan of like pinup art. So in that way, um, it's more of like borderline erotica, um, but more cheesecake kind of stuff. So the sexuality that I tried to present through the work that I was doing was more um, sort of this vintage cheesecake look. Um, and when, you know, I started getting more and more into published work in college and stuff, I got more into writing the work that I was doing as well. And seeing that, you know, I don't have to follow these guidelines in order to get work. I can sort of pave my own path and it doesn't need to be mainstream, but it is something that I feel more comfortable in putting out into the world. Um, and, you know, over the years I learned about the missing murdered indigenous women issues, um, which I was unaware of, you know, while I was in college, um, being so far removed from a lot of the native community. I grew up in the city after I was five, we moved away from Satwewa. So I, I don't have a large group of native people that I'm close to or around um, at any one time, just due to my location and due to our, our tribal politics and stuff. Um, so um, yeah, like with, with Echo, the one thing that I remembered seeing her when she was presented in the original comic book, um, her outfit is basically like just exercise wear. Like she made her her costume. It's not something that's like spandex and zippers and all these things. It was like a sports bra. Um, I think some Doc Martin boots, some like athletic pants, and she's like electrical tape or, you know, um, e exercise tape to wind around her hands. And it was very... Um, very minimalistic and basic and she was also a dancer a, a trained ballerina so the the ability of david mack to showcase the f female body in a non-explicit way in a very graceful way showing strength through the the dance qualities and the anatomy that way was something i really appreciated and he's always you know been very respectful in the way that he um puts women forth he's very aware of you know, the environment that he's putting work into in major comic books. And he's very aware that you don't have to sexualize women in that way, that they can be shown very beautifully, very strong um, and on their own terms. And I really, really appreciate that um, even now with his work. So the, with the work I'm doing now, he's changed her outfit up a little bit, but it's still just very cut and dry. Like what would be um, something that a dancer or somebody that was physically fit, what would they wear to be comfortable? And I'm thinking about that when I'm drawing her too. Like, if I'm going to go hiking, what, what are my favorite <laughs> hiking boots? So I kind of threw in like my favorite brand of hiking boots and um, athletic boots that in, in the artwork that I'm doing. But it's, it's very much just about strength, personal strength. It's not about, um, you know, this, this male gaze or this sexualization in the work that I'm doing. And I, I really hope that that become something that's more standard in comics. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing female characters presented less as like, you know, from the male gaze and from these very sexualized shots that were, you know, pro predominant in the nineties and early two thousands and something more for um, young women to read and feel comfortable reading um, and to see strength in. And I think that's really important in the comic book world. So I'm seeing change from the inside and it's, it's inspiring. It sounds really inspiring. A common theme that I'm also hearing from you, or from all of you, is um, basically giving representation for the next generation as well. This idea that there were things that we grew up with that did not exist. We're creating those things that were missing. But now there's, of course, we're still growing forward and we're continuing this mission. And I guess this takes us to our last part of the panel, which is futures. Uh, we are slightly going over time, but I thank you all for taking part in this as well. This has been very kind of you. Um, to wrap it up a little bit without taking too much more time, what are the things that you would like to see change in the next 10, 15 years in terms of how Native art is treated, what Native artists are doing, 
where Native artists are, who's asking for Native art, any of these topics, anything that you'd like to see happen in the future, I'd love to hear from any of you. Um, if anybody's interested to speak right now, otherwise I can just choose someone. <laughs> All right, Rico. Um, I think uh, another theme that I've been, or, or to build off the theme that you had just called out is like the, the idea that we keep saying and coming back to is that like we're all reclaiming. Um, and I think as we move in the future, it'll be, it'll be less about reclaiming and more about celebrating. You know, now we can celebrate that there's, that, that there, that there is native owned lingerie company. We could celebrate that there's native comic illustrators. We could celebrate that there's native photographers. So now it's going to be like, you know, so how do we, how do we, um, be able to uplift and celebrate each other and then also you know be able to engage with with um everybody else in our in our worlds um native and non-native and for us to be all able to celebrate that together so thank you rico I'll jump in real quick and I'll say that um, I really hope to see more financial support for natives in the arts um, in the future. Um, very much about reclamation of um, tribal space of land and also identity because I think that, you know, all the work that we're doing and other native artists are doing right now is really healing um, the effects of 250 to 500 years of genocide. Um, and it's it's so inspiring just to see the difference between what my generation is doing from what my parents' generation were able to do and to pave ways. Um, so especially in California, I would really love to see um, lands, tribal lands, return to the tribal people and have funds set up so it's not such a struggle. Um, and to go back to some of the traditional arts because there is a relationship that we really, really need to regain um, in traditional arts with land-based and plant-based um, materials um, just for that continued healing process. And I can go. Um, I, I mean, I love what Rico had just said about celebration as opposed um, to reclaiming because we're like getting there and I love that idea of just celebrating our culture, our individual lives, our peers, and um, especially what Jada said earlier too about celebrating the memory and supporting um, the memory of creation. And that's like exactly what my work is, me learning about Cheyenne design and me making these big paintings that um, people like, that people appreciate, and that people can go and look at the original beadwork that inspired these paintings. So looking into the future, yeah, celebration. I wanna see more native curators. I wanna see more natives on the biggest platforms that, art, that our art world has to offer. I wanna see more native women curators and artists. Right now I have a bunch of inspired, I mean, there's so many beautiful, inspiring native artists, but I wanna see more women up there like Diani and Jada and um, so we can celebrate them because, um, their voices are not being shared as widely as they really should be. So that's what I would like to see as we go forward, more native owned brands to celebrate too. Yeah, um, so I guess for myself, um, I am calling in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. That is where my studio is. And if you've watched the news even for a second, <laughs> these past few months, you know what happened here with the killing of George Floyd. Um, but that has ultimately led to this widespread racial reckoning within the world. Um, and, and being here in that moment, I didn't even, I didn't even know that this had, like everything that was going on here had gone national. Um, but there's something to be said about that racial reckoning that, had, that has just happened where I have grown up in Minnesota my entire life and I've never felt at home here, never, not once. And it wasn't until this all happened um, and that I seen people take to the streets 
and that I seen people finally call out white supremacy and, and call out like this, this culture of dominance. And I finally feel at home here. And that's what I want for the future of native people is to feel at home. Thank you. That was so powerful. Thank you, Jada. And thank you all for sharing your visions and your hopes. Um, we have a few minutes left of this panel. Uh, if anybody from the audience has any questions, uh, this is the time to ask. Otherwise, we can uh, thank you guys and move on with the rest of our days. Let's see. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a question from, I think, Ash Leo Massing is raising their hand. I'll allow them to talk. I hope this works. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, my name's Ash. I'm a student. I'm an MPhil uh, ge geography student at the University of Cambridge. I'm um, native East Malaysian, and I was just wondering, um, someone talked about not feeling at home and I sort of wanted to bring that up a little bit because um, I've always talked about how being native is feeling as though you're diasporic in your ancestral land and I thought I wanted to I, I just thought you know if anybody wanted to sort of jump on that and talk about what it means to belong you know um, to a certain place and how that's related to I guess things like you know, anxieties about the past and anxieties about the future and stuff like that. Thank you, Ash. Greatly appreciate your question. Uh, is anybody up to having the conversation? I'll um, jump in on that. Um, I, my tribal base is basically uh, Los Angeles, Pasadena, Santa Monica of Southern California. Um, and you bring up, you know, being indigenous in somebody else's land or on somebody else's land. Um, but honestly, when I go into LA, I, I know it's my tribal homeland, but I feel this disconnect and this like just sadness um, to know that our tribe will probably never be allowed um, through the federal government to have a tribal land base or a reservation land due to the way that, um, you know, the United States took over and also due to the fact that Los Angeles is one of the richest cities in the United States. Um, the land is, you know, big property, big money, and they're not going to give that up without a fight. Um, so going into a place, knowing it's your land, knowing that your ancestors lived there for over 10,000 years and that they sustain themselves on that land through the food, which is no longer there seeing, seeing trees, you know, just diminished and seeing cement, you know, completely constrict the waterways. The LA river is completely cemented in and knowing that that was the major, you know, waterway that sustained people for thousands of years and it's the same water. Um, so yeah, there, there's this disconnect that I have personally. Um, you know, I'm, I currently reside on Chumash territory. They were a neighboring tribe. So I, I feel like I'm a guest on this land, um, but I also don't feel at home on my own land when I go back and visit. And that's something that I've really struggled to deal with over the last couple of years in understanding why I don't feel, feel allowed or feel like that, that uh, this land is the land that I, I should be able to see. I feel very connected, you know, when I go there and I, I pray and um, spend time on the land, but there's always that disconnect because there's cement everywhere I go. Um, it's so rare that there's actual, you know, raw earth where you can get your, your feet into and um, even, even the ocean. I mean, there's, there's so much pollution in the ocean that used to be our, our, our main, um, you know, subsistence and a, a place where we traveled upon too. So I don't know if there's a, a way to resolve it. I think you have to just kind of go through the motions and go through whatever you feel is comfortable to regain that relationship with the land, whether it's land that you're residing on as a guest or your traditional homeland, because so much damage has been done and there's, there's so much that we have to 
get through day to day um, from the effects of colonization. But I don't know if that completely answers your question, but that's kind of where I feel um, I personally, you know, sit with the relationship with my own land um, and, you know, how it is very conflicting to exist in this space now. Um, I share that feeling. I mean, I, I grew up in Mitzkanaka on Tongva land for most of my life, but at the same time, only this past year was the first time I'd ever gone to where my tribe had come from in Georgia. And I mean, it was so cathartic to touch that earth, but also so disconnected at the same time and felt familiar and alien in this really weird way I couldn't quite put my fingers on. And our tribe was moved uh, in the 1820s and 1830s across the Mississippi to uh, the current boundaries of Oklahoma. We only recently got our reservation land back, and I've been to I've been to the reservation as a child. Well, it, what is now the reservation, because we didn't even have legal status as a reservation when I was a child. Um, but nonetheless, even there, there was a strong dis. There's a connect with people, but there was a disconnect from the land, and I think that I think that there's a deeper question here about how do we imagine a future where we can make that connection again, where we can restore that connection. And I think that's one of the regenerative aspects of art. Um, as well as to imagine these kind of futures where we can kind of start to heal these traumas through larger conversations. I don't know, some musings. Uh, do we have a, anybody else who wants to chime in on this question or any more questions to ask? <clears throat> there are some questions in the Q&A box. All right, I cannot see it for some reason if you would like to ask. Okay, we have a question to Jada. Um, what is a difference in perceiving or conceptualizing the making of the earrings with traditional native design as art or as craft? I don't know if you can see the question. I can try to... I can see it. Oh, okay, um, you can. I guess I would like to open it up to the other panelists as well. Um, I've gotten into so many very heated conversations about the difference between the word art and craft specifically <laughs> in school um, and like my understanding of it and this is like where I come from is like they both have the same thing like they both mean the same thing overall it's just like this kind of like case system of a word I guess whereas like craft is like deemed as being lower than art um, and I don't understand it. Like, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. To me, like, there isn't a difference between the two. Um, so I don't know that I'm the best person to answer this question. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Jada. It's, I mean, especially in terms of how a Native art is recognized, it's often under the umbrella of craft, which I think is, like, heartbreaking because craft is as important if not more and i two words that also come to mind are um process versus concept so like conceptual art versus process-based art and i mean often conceptual art is the ones that you know are getting more worldwide attention and they're deemed more like interesting or important compared to something that's just beautifully made and um I, yeah, I don't get why we have to like dissect and talk about and like, yeah, box these two things because they're both equally as important and there's so much overlap. Even with my own personal art, it's very process-based and also conceptual, but the craft is really important. The actual execution of my work and also even in fashion, the execution matters and the craft of design matters. Um, for the concept to even work. So I do think, um, I mean, it is definitely worth debating or even talk, I'm sure you got into super heated arguments over what this means, but um, I'm in the boat of like, why do we have to really um, differentiate and why does it have to, why does it come up with native art and not other people's art? Like, that's my question. Why, I mean, most white artists never get even asked about craft. Great, thank you, Jordan. Um, let's see. I finally figured out how to work the Q&A box. This is new to me, so thank you guys. 
Um, we have a following comment from uh, Daniel Herzberg. I know in Australia, a number of indigenous, indigenous clothing companies have designated particular pieces of clothing as being for non-indigenous allies. I'm curious whether there are any similar discussions in your community or on non-indigenous people purchasing your artwork or wearing your clothing or jewelry. I can, I can push that one. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a, a, a topic that, that we've discussed and um, at Trickster Company, that's, that's, that's a big part of what we do. Um, the advantage, the, the reason that you, the reason that appropriation is a big topic is because it's about uh, people from outside the culture, you know, taking advantage of of things that come from the culture. So, here in Southeast Alaska, we've spent like the last, you know, ten thousand years developing form line style art, and so uh, it's an investment that we've made, and um, uh, and it's important that it's represented in the proper way, and. So for us, the clothing that we make in at Trickster Company, we we make leggings and T-shirts and and all kinds of apparel and jewelry. Um, and and the the other second advantage of of work of purchasing from native-owned companies is native designers will know where the line is. They they know like we know not to use clan crests. We know to not use designs that are associated with sacred things. So we know which items we can put into our store and, and sell to non-native people because, uh, because I mean, a lot of our, our arts is, is, a lot of native art is internationally recognized. It's, it's, it was like immediately internationally recognized as, like, so it's, um, so it's people want to be able to appreciate it, and and so native people can curate in a way that allows non natives to appreciate it. Yeah, I completely agree with Rico. It's interesting with the um, reading the question, Daniel, about having certain items for non indigenous allies, and I think I mean not to generalize, but the brands that I've seen, there will even be like even a part of the website that says for non-native buyers, um, you're welcome. Like this, this is for you too. And I have friends that are non-native and um, she'll like, my friend Allison recently complimented my beautiful beaded earrings. And um, she, I was like, you should support this artist. She does custom work, she's amazing. And she's like, oh no, I, I couldn't. Like I'm, I, I, feel, I would feel weird, I would, I would feel like, I'm appropriating, I'm like, but you're not, you're supporting a native artist. And I think a lot of people feel kind of weird because especially people that are more sensitive to what appropriation means. And so I said, no, that it makes a difference when you support that artist directly. And a lot of people on their websites will even have a little disclaimer saying, um, you're, you can buy from us directly, like this is good, this is supportive, you can be an ally. And um, in, in my own brand, and I believe with Rico too, we don't have like designated items for non-natives. Like, um, like I would want native and non-native women to wear any of our undergarments and jewelry and show their support. So it's, it's even though our brand is to uplift native women and, and non-binary people, it's not necessarily for just them. It's for everyone to celebrate what we're doing. Yeah, and then I think also just to be just for it to be said as well, like a lot of the appropriation is talking about, you know, like the selling of sacred cultural items that are meant for Native people and non-Native people, whereas say my earrings are not a sacred item, you know, they're not a ceremonial item, they're open for everybody. And I wouldn't sell sacred items. Like I, I know that that's in my teachings. That's like what my elders have taught me. Um, and so that disclaimer on a lot of like, I'm a part of the Be Yellowtail Collective, you know, and, and she says we're indigenously designed for all. Um, 
And so I think there's like a, a distinction there, you know, like sometimes people will design a t-shirt specifically just for native people, but they will say that there's good communication. <laughs> And, and if there's something that you feel iffy about, you know, ask somebody like, oh, like, don't, don't go and like buy, um, like pipes off of eBay. Like, I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's a very clear distinction between two things, like between like something that's like more contemporary, like available, like, you know, like Rico's leggings, which are awesome. <laughs> like Jordan's paintings, you know, um, as opposed to our sacred cultural items. Great, thank you guys so much for that. Um, let's see, we have one more question here. On, I'm not sure how, if anybody wants to respond to this, but uh, how do you imagine your ancestors might respond to your work today? Uh, the context for this question is both in terms of pride and what you were doing, but also the cultural and economic framework within which you are working is vastly different from what they would have known. For example, brands, art galleries, etc. So how do you see this context of work of healing and reclaiming in this modern context? I mean, I guess part of it is just that we're not, I mean, we're not stuck in any past. I mean, I mean you could ask that to anybody. How do we view our ancestors looking at us today? Um, I would imagine, I would hope with pride and that they're watching over us and taking care of us and guiding us. At the same time, I mean, economic systems come and go. And I would also say that some of the economic systems that we exist within today are um, things that native artists sometimes also actively choose to avoid in many different capacities. I don't know if anybody, any of the panelists would like to join that conversation. Um, I, I'll take a hit at it. Um, a lot of the work that I do, especially my personal work, is in regards to reclaiming indigenous stories from the histories um, and bringing them to light so people can have a better understanding of either historical events that happen to our people um, or uh, maybe resetting some propaganda that was already established by United States history. So in regards to that, I, I really you know focus a lot about ancestors and my ancestors in particular. Um, one of the graphic novels that I recently finished, which was with the Library Company of Philadelphia, um, was to reframe the historical event of the Paxton Massacre on the East Coast, uh, which was never written about from an indigenous lens. It was always written about from a historically white lens. Um, and so by taking on this project, um, which was done you know, in collaboration with Lee Francis, who's Laguna Pueblo, um, we were able to take a historical event that was very violent and that oftentimes um, either ignored or glossed over the indigenous victims and really establish them as people um, who were set into a context of a life um, and, you know, honor them in a way that I think most historical accounts of Native people does not honor people. Um, I, I also am doing tribal work and using historical resources to um, shed light on Tongva people and you know their fight against colonialism and also of you know Spanish conquest. Um, and so, I I really try to be sensitive to what I can share, what I feel is maybe um, you know, something that's, that's not for public consumption, um, but present ancestors in a, a way that um, gives them some, some education um, and some, some light. So outside people who are non-native can start to see our individuals as actual human beings. Um, you know, worthy of compassion, worthy of understanding, and they weren't just bodies that got taken down by colonialism or, um, you know, aren't worthy of a, a, a historian writing about them because they all have their own individual stories and I think those are so important. So um, that's just how, how my own work um, pertains to that particular question. Great, thank you so much, Wishwayo. Um, I want to thank you all for taking part in the panel today. I don't want to take any more of your day. We've gone a bit over time. Um, but Rico, Jordan, I'll show you 
also Jada, who unfortunately had to leave. She is an on-call journalist and had to leave before we were able to wrap up. Um, and just want to thank you all so much for taking part in this. Thank you for the really thought thought provoking and meaningful discussions today and just for sharing with us your own personal experiences and ideas. Thanks for organizing this. Thanks for having us. Of course. Uh, thank you, Devlin. You're an awesome chair. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you again for including me. It's been a great pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thanks, participants. Bye. Bye. Thank you.